and um, after he goes through his story and shares um, his journey, we have the opportunity to ask him questions, to elaborate on anything that we find interesting. So give the floor to you. Thank you so much for coming, Nima. We're going to be seeing a lot more of you. So the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone, for being here. Um, I guess just to give a brief intro of what, what's happened um, at the moment, what, what I've basically come to now is, I've, as Kimi has said, I did start my journey in Australia. I was born and raised here. Now I'm in America. My company is over five staff, and um, I've helped many other people like myself build wealth, especially through property which has allowed me to spend my time how I want. So in the last few years, you know, I've lived in multiple countries and basically, you know, living life on my terms, essentially. So hopefully today you can gain some, you know, insight or motivation from my story and maybe a few of the strategies I use that worked well for me. Um, so I guess, you know, going back to where it started, uh, you know, I come from immigrant parents um, so that was always good, as, as a lot of you would know, um, because from day one, they've had to work very hard to come to a new country. So my parents are from Iran, um, Zoroastrian as well. So they basically came to Australia with nothing, no English and no money. So they basically built the backbone and, you know, it was very much instilled in us in a young age. And I think I always um, was reminded at a young age, you can't take anything for granted. Nothing's going to come free for you. So I guess from a very young age, I was always looking at doing things efficiently and I guess um, appreciating every opportunity and realising that there's so much more yet in a Western society like Australia. So that in itself was so motivating as a child and I guess allowed me to very much work hard. Um, I didn't very much thrive well at school. Um, I guess, you know, some would say, you know, a naughty boy or <laughs> whatever you call it, but I always wanted to do things my way. So the schooling system wasn't essentially always great for me. Um, you know, I would have my parents come in and grades weren't good or Neem is distracting other kids in the class. So, you know, from a young age, I thought maybe, you know, something's not right with me. And um, but I was still such an ambitious child in the sense that I was always excelling in sport. So I guess that kept me um, motivated. And um, I guess I started my first job, real job was a paper boy. Um, and I remember the way that started was I think I was 13 and I heard um, another guy in my year was working at McDonald's and I was, I was really jealous. I was like, he's already get, earning money and I'm not. And that's when I realized I had a real big passion for money from that age. And um, essentially, I became a paper boy, was delivering to, you know, my local area at the time, advertising paper. And then um, sooner or later, I was doing it to, you know, more or less the whole county delivering paper. And, you know, I was pretty much spending zero time on study and all my time on something like that, which, you know, obviously parents were not very happy with. But, you know, to me, that's what I felt like was right at the time. And, and um from there, basically, I saved every dollar I made. And um, I mean, that that's one of the biggest goals is um, to build wealth, you've got to have money to start with. So anyone who says that um, you don't is basically, it's, it's not factual. You, you need some degree of money to start with. And I'm so fortunate that at that age, I was saving up so hard. So I basically kept doing that till the age of like 18 years old, my final year of school. And I'd saved, obviously, at that age, it was a lot of money, $15,000. Um, and then when I was 18, I know there's a few things that kind of changed my life. Um, I read a book called Rich Dad, Poor Dad, which I'll say how that completely changed my life. And I was researching um, a property investor, Nathan Birch at the time, who was a high school dropout who ended up having 200 more properties and um, you know started his own successful business where he helped other people create passive income from property. So that's essentially what happened at that point. And um, I think those two things were the real changes um, as much as my life as well before. And I guess it was going into my year 12 final exam studies where I should have been, um, you know, focusing on, like everyone else, getting the best grades possible so I can go to the best university and get the good job that obviously everyone um, is told to do, you know, become a doctor, lawyer, engineer. And that's what I thought was um 
uh, was what I had to do if I wanted to have a good life, good family and, and all the rest. And um, it was really stressful because going into that, you think, wow, my whole life is dependent on how I perform academically in year 12 up until I read this book and um, studied that property invested that I realized that's not the case. And, and I kept my journey really on continuing to build uh, my wealth, even doing mischievous jobs um, um, to do so. So while, while everyone was studying, I stumbled upon LinkedIn and I thought, you know, why don't I see if I can get a better job? So I applied for like 100, 200 jobs. And while I was meant to be studying, I was, you know, suited up, you know, grew out my beard at the time, you know, ethnic um, blood. Fortunately, we can look 10 years older than we are. And uh, went to all these interviews and people thought, you know, he's presenting himself well. He seems to know what he's talking about, even though he probably, I probably didn't at the time. And, uh, you know, I got a few jobs and one of them happened to be the top um, brokerage company in Australia. So, and that, that's where it kind of started, where the, the hu hustle and the love for money then exchanged with a job that helped me understand the knowledge of money. So I think three days after my last exam, I started full time in this company at 18. Bear in mind, as I said, I'd saved about fifteen, twenty thousand dollars at this point. Um, so that that's what allowed me to jet start my dream of getting into property and start investing in property. So from that age, I had my goals straight that, you know, I need to get a property at 18. You know, that was the big thing for me and, and I did everything I could to do so. But then I realised it's not so easy. You need to actually have an income because I was working in the field as well um, in a mortgage broking company, helping other people, investors do it. So I was literally seeing with my own eyes at 18, not only what others are hearing, but seeing others' incomes, what they can borrow, how they're investing, how good properties defer to bad properties and how, you know, a, a good property can be the, stepping stone to fortune, whereas a bad property investment essentially can send you back, um, you know, years. So a lot of this was really good and, and, and it realised that, you know, it's not as easy as, oh, I want a property at 18, let's do it. Um, it took me till the age of 22 before I did, um, but then I managed to get three um, in that same year. And why I say that is because this all only happened with about 30, 40,000 in savings. So that's that's the big thing here is that you don't need um, a lot of money. You don't need a big salary job. You just need commitment. So I think the number one thing um, with financial freedom is you've got to uh, first have a job that gives you income. Then you've got to do everything to save. So I stayed at home, um, you know, going out on the weekends. I try to drink it you know, pre-drink at home as much as possible as opposed to in the club, anything I could to save an extra dollar. Because in the way I think is every dollar saved now and invested is 10 more dollars for me in the future. So for me, it's opportunity cost and it makes sense to do so. So I I lived the very high sacrifice life while I was young, uh, worked you know, endless hours because I saw how if I can create, um, you know, a passive income, by the time I'm 30, for example, that can replace my income, then I've really saved 35 years of working life then to retire. So that made sense to me that while I'm youthful, young, and I can learn things and be adaptive, why not utilise that to my capacity and do everything I can to um, learn everything at a young age, make as much as a young age. And in the process, I really enjoyed it too because I think when you're doing something so great that you see what it's going to lead to in the long run, um, it is quite motivating and, and, and it helps you to make those sacrifices. So going back to the story, um, so at this point I was working at this job, I was realising, you know, you've got to make this much income to borrow this much money. Um, you've got to be able to save this much. You've got to be able to show this length of work history. So I continued to do that um, and learn, learn the industry, right? Um, then I also went into the basically the Royal Commission happened where it was very hard to lend in Australia. So then I went and worked in a stockbroking company. And in that stockbroking company, I learned everything that I wasn't learning in the mortgage broking company, which is buying a property is expensive. So three, four hundred thousand dollars or getting to fifty thousand dollars in savings or a hundred thousand dollars isn't so easy. So I started investing in the stock market and it helped working in that job. So I think key number one is save, sacrifice, work hard whatever you do, put it in investments that you feel confident in the stock market so it can escalate your growth. That's what I did. There's other ways of investing too that my company do as well, like such as 
um, bonds and debentures and all things. But um, for me personally, at the time, I was going into stocks that I believe would do well in the next few years. And that, that accelerated my saving process to when I was actually ready and had the income to do so. So I had this knowledge at both times and, and it saved uh, my money to this point. And then essentially at that point, it was time to go. I found um, a property and I think something that I'd say most of you try avoid is analysis paralysis. I think I spent two years trying to find the perfect property and it didn't exist, right? So in hindsight, I probably would have trusted a professional to find the property. Um, so, you know, you pay them what they do and at least you know that they've got a track record it's worth it because every day you don't get in the market, you're actually losing money. So that's another big lesson I learned was that um, for every dollar you don't gain now is actually $10 you lose in the future. The same philosophy I, I mentioned earlier. So, um, you know, that's one of the things I would have done differently, but, you know, I'm still happy that I did get in eventually at, at 22 um, and I bought the right property. Now that the skill there was, Buying prop there's three things that I look for. It's buying property under value um, because that way you unlock equity straight away, right? The other thing is you want to make sure the property isn't, it's not so much of a big deal if it's positive um, or negatively geared. It's more so neutrally geared is what you need. You don't want to be losing money in the property. It's not a big deal in the short term to make money on the property too because that's, again, what you're trying to do in five, 10 years. What's important is, unlocking capital gains which means from the money you buy it to what it's really worth in a short period of time so that you can actually take that money out and reinvest it into your next property right um and it's really interesting once you see people do it so hopefully my story can be a bit of a case study so i've done it personally for many other clients but i rather use it myself because that way i know it's factual and as accurate as possible so um yeah so that was getting the first property um and i only needed um thirty thousand dollars to get that first property so you always want to engage in a good mortgage broker to start with essentially um in america or australia it's a similar process there it's a free service they don't charge you for um it's what it's one of the services my company do whether you choose to use us or anyone else it's free i recommend always using a mortgage broker the bank pays them a commission the one they take you to so it's always good gauging advice now because a lot of the time people aren't ready, especially at a young age. You realize, oh, I need to save or I need to pay off this credit card or I need to get an income uh, job that's paying this much if I want to borrow this much. So you get prepared with all these things and then eventually you'll um, prepare yourself, right? So in this case, I only needed, I had more saves, but I only needed 30000 for my first one. I wanted to put the minimum down so that I could um, maximize the rest that I'd saved with other properties and um, essentially I um, got this first one and I got it, um, you know, about 15% under value, right? So it was about a hundred thousand dollars of equity I could have unlocked. And straight away, about six months later, I went to the same bank, revalued the property and they would lend 80% and 80% is the sweet, um, sweet number. So just so you know what that means is, with a property, the bank will generally lend you 80% of the value of the property. You have to put down 20%. So, for example, for a $500,000 property, you have to put down $100,000. The bank will generally be happy to lend you four hundred. They can lend you more than 80%. They go up to 95% sometimes. But then you've got to pay lended, lenders mortgage insurance, which you want to try avoid, obviously, these fees. But in Australia at the time, and I know they still do now, You can for your first property, you can only put down 5% and still avoid it. It's like an incentive to get in. So that's what I did with the first one and straight away unlocked property um, equity. And on top of my savings, that straight away allowed me in six months time to buy two more properties and to go to three. Now, I pretty much continued this process for the next few years with a multitude of properties to eventually start replacing my income with property, right? And the thing is properties will continu um, continuously get new capital gains. So if these properties continue going, you know, anywhere from eight to 10% a year, which is like country average, you're constantly without doing anything, unlocking equity 
as the debt I always recommend take on is principal and interest. So the debt you have is going down while the property is going up. So over time, you can, even if you stop at five or 10 properties, over time, you can continue to unlock equity and continue to buy more and more um, property, right? So it really doesn't matter at the income at the end of the day. That's the big stress here. Um, and so that that's that's how that um, started on the property side. I can I don't want to bore too many people, but more than happy to to share more on how that works in different case studies on different incomes. But with myself at that point, I had the mortgage broking experience, the stock broking experience, and I took the risk um, of starting a business while I was working full time. At the time, I was running a sales team for a fintech company. And I started my business on the side. So I was working 16, 18 hour days. And then eventually once my business, which is now Kamani, which is Kamani Capital, once that was big enough, I left my full-time job to pursue uh, my business, um, which again, it was so many times in my life where I've had periods where it's regret. Again, no one was really supportive of this idea because we all know how much business fails um, but, you know, again, that's why you got to play it smart. You started on the side and build it. So I already knew that when I was switching from full-time work to my business, that yes, my income was less, but I could still survive, right? And I could still pay the mortgages. And um, another big thing is you always, my, my sweet number is you want to have at least three months saved on mortgage repayments. So if you do, and you are interested in building a property portfolio, and I know a lot of um, elderly, like my parents hate debt, um, and it is a scary thing in the sense that if you don't take the right measures and risk to look after it, it can be an issue. But as I said, go neutrally geared properties always. Never go neg negatively geared. What I do is I always make a buffer of three months. So I know at any time um, I've always got three months worth of cash in an offset account, which is what it ultimately is the savings account that sits with your mortgage that any money you put there you save on interest repayments. So I always have three months sitting in there so that, you know, if my business went down or a crisis happened, that, that that measure would be there, even though it's not needed, as I said, because it's neutral. That's a risk I take and I recommend. Um, so I had that all done so I could take the risk to start my own business. And, um, yeah, essentially then I started doing this with more and more people um, and I started gaining a very good reputation for structuring people's loans and going to the right bank because with unlocking valuations right every bank will value your property differently so what we do is we at least do six to eight different online valuations with different banks so we can tell our clients which valuation is more sometimes it's different of two hundred thousand dollars that's different so that's another thing that's worth noting is do go to as many banks as possible see which one gives you the best valuation go ahead with them and then, um, yeah, then you can keep the ball moving. The idea is do more in a shorter period of time because if you can have 10 properties now as opposed to um, 10 properties growing at 7% now as opposed to, you know, three growing at 12%, it's still going to outlast having the 10 at 7 because you've built the, the ground quicker. So just doing, you know, compounding maths. There's a lot of good calculators online where you can do compounding interest. But the key I always say is do as much as you can earlier and earlier because, you know, the future you will be more thankful because it's all about the foreground. And, um, yeah, so with my business, sorry if I'm going very back and forth with the investing and my journey. But, um, yeah, when I then went back to the business and we built that up, I essentially outsourced all that and started getting involved in a lot of private equity investments myself. Um, and that's where my investments can quickly gear up their deposits. Um, Cause you want to do everything as you want to do anything to build short wealth in the short term and the long term. So property is great in the long term, but how do you get to your next deposit? How do you get to your next five deposits? I personally use the stock market for that and for my clients. Obviously, it's a lot more risky, um, but with the right measures, you should be able to escalate the process. So we do a lot of companies that are pre-IPO so that before a company lists on the stock market, where we get our investors in at generally a 20 to 30% discount to when they IPO. So that allows in a short period of time, obviously, this is not, um, I should have said this at the beginning, but this is not financial advice by any means. 
um, take your own risk and take get your own advice. But essentially that is a riskier measure that allows you to get a quicker return in a shorter period of time. And as long as the company and the leadership team and you know all of the things stack up, generally you should be in a good position. And we pull out of the money on that and then reinvest it in property. Um, so yeah, with my you know fortunately to this day I've grown the business to the point where um, it kind of runs without me. I've also got the properties working without me. Um, the key is to do to do as much at the beginning and then later outsource as much as possible so you can enjoy life, do life on your terms, and then obviously think bigger. I think that's the big thing. Like if I could, th if we can think like that while younger, why, why limit that? What's the next thing to think? Um, what's the next best idea? Um, and that's why I'm in America now involved in a tech startup company and I'm running the sales, the, I'm the VP of the sales now. Um, and I'm going to help them get to IPO. So generally, I just raise capital, but now I'm actually going to work within a business to get their revenue numbers to a certain point where they can either get acquired by a bigger company or do an IPO. So that's what I've moved on to. But bear in mind, no matter what I keep doing, um, I can only do this because of a few things. Because I thought ahead of the game, I invested my money, I worked very hard, which allows me to do things that are what I want to do now. But also, I've still got um, what I started and what you put so much effort still working for me. I'm still at the end of the day, whatever I do, I'm still going to keep my goal of growing the property portfolio. I'm going to continue to nurture that goal and recommend that for that for people as their starting ground. Um, I will still continue to help investors and with my own money escalate it through investing in the stock market. And that's what allows you to be free at the end of the day. So, um, that's essentially it now. And, 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 you know, last year I worked in New York for three months for my own business. I grew it out there. Um, and then earlier this year where I saw a lot of you, I was in London for a few months. And now I'm again in America for three, four months before I return back to Australia. But the beauty is that you can do what you want. And, um, you know, that that's, that's, that's the goal at the end of the day is living life on your terms. I don't believe that we're here to, to work for 45 years and then retire for 20 when you can't really do anything and you're old and the things you find fun and exciting as a 20 year old, you, you might not then. So I'm, I've said this a few times. It's like, my goal is to achieve everything in your twenties. And I think that is achievable. And uh, whether you are in your twenties or thirties or forties, it's never too late because if you do it right, it's not an overnight process, but it's a, but it's definitely achievable in at least five to 10 years. And I think uh, we can all agree that's a lot better than working um 40 for 45 years so yeah that's um that's everything if anyone's got any questions or would like to talk to me in private i'm more than happy to do so again i'm so happy for what the community has given to me i've met so many lovely um Zoroastrians over the last few years and reconnected with the community now that i have a lot more time and um it's something that i it just makes me happy if i can help in any way and um, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. That was really, really amazing. Um, I saw there was like some questions in the chat. I personally wrote down my questions too. So I'll go with the chat questions first to be respectful of other people. So I think the first question that someone wrote in, it was Bijan and he was asking, what were the lucky and unlucky moments you faced? Yeah, very good question. Very good question. Um, I think um, luck is putting yourself out there and unluck is trying new things. So it's kind of like a catch-22. But the, the big thing is learning from each one, right? So I think some of the luckiest experiences were the, were the people I met, the people that guided me in which direction I should go. And, and that was a matter of putting myself out there and asking more questions and um, doing everything I can to, to grow. So I think the luckiest things that have happened to me in life is the people I've met who've put me in hand with the right people that have allowed me to do what I'm doing as a business or study do so. Like, for example, if I never read the book Rich Dad Poured Out or never studied the property investor Nathan Birch, I honestly don't know if I would be here today. So in se some sense, that's a lot of luck that those things happened to me at a young age. And I think some of the unluckiest things that have happened to me is um 
probably some of the investments. You don't win every investment. Um, I'm not going to say judge me on my losers because there's I don't have any or anything like that. I have losers and some of my losers are just as bad as my wins, um, just like any human. So, And some of these investments, you do all the research you possibly can and it still doesn't go the way you want. So unfortunately, I have had some big financial losses too. But the idea is, as I tell my investors, you've got to look at everything as a picture. And as long as you're doing well overall and you're beating the market, that's what matters. So that's my answer to that. Love it. Love it. Rich dad, poor dad changed my life too. I don't think I would be where I am without that book honestly i read it when i was 20 so two years after you um another question another question zal um said this one so he wrote how do you invest in companies pre-ipo is that a benefit of being a vc do you just need to have the connections great question and um i think that's um another great point is that i with the luck, I would never have invested in pre-IPOs if I didn't work in finance. So it's very rare for you to just stumble on pre-IPOs. You have to at least talk to someone in finance or be in finance to even come it because they are private. They're not offered to the public. So it's very hard to get it. You've got to get in touch with investment um, firms, investment firms like, um, you know, small private equity firms, you, you can get access to them through me, but I don't have access to all the deals. Every different company has different ones. Some focus on the tech sector, some focus on mining. Australian mining and agriculture are very big, so those are what we're focused on. But I'd say the biggest, um, if, if the best thing to do is Google investment advisors around your area, meet with them and see what pre or IPO or private equity opportunities they have access to. You don't have to work in the field. You just need to have an advisor that, has access to those opportunities because um, most people now within the financial planning wealth advisor realm do know someone they can help. Yeah. Love it. He also said, I'd love to have a one-on-one -on -one in the future. I will send you a message and that's all. Um, okay. Then we have Kia who asked, how do you decide how much leverage to put in each property? How do you manage tenants? Yeah. Great question. As I said, I go to, I go to 80% because I want to do the maximum leverage. Um, I want to do the maximum leverage with the minimal um, input of my own money without extra fees incurring. So what I do then is in Australia, it's 80%. I'm pretty sure America would be very similar as well. Again, engage a mortgage broker for that because my philosophy, everyone's got different risk tolerance, but my philosophy is I want to use as much of the bank's money as possible because if I'm finding properties under value and engaging in good um, property investment services that are going to get me those returns, I'm better off leveraging as much as possible of the bank's money. The bank's rates right now, you're looking at anywhere from 6 to 7%. Um, so with what I said, you're looking far beyond those returns. So it's worth taking the money from the bank to get those returns. And bear in mind, Leverage is a great thing, just, just to give you a, a very basic example of why it's great. Let's say you do the 80% um, leverage, which means you're borrowing five times your money. If you put $100,000 in a property and it's a $500,000 property, if this property goes up 10%, um, it hasn't actually gone up just 10%. It's gone up um, five times against the money because you've only put in $100,000, a $500,000 property going up 10% is $50,000. So you've put $100,000 in and it's gone up by $50,000. So by your money, it's gone up 50%. So if you can understand that idea, you realize how powerful leverage is if you're buying the right assets. That's awesome. He, oh, he said, also, can you sell me that pen you're holding? He loves your pen. <laughs> <laughs> Um, there was a second part to his question how do you manage tenants yeah sorry how do you manage tenants yeah. I always a property manager I used to think do it all save every dollar that's a good idea when you're starting but if you're going to grow a property portfolio of 5, 10, 20 properties and you're focusing on your core day-to-day -day job or business you can't do that hire a property manager they generally can charge anything from 5 to 10% of the rental income but it's worth it they deal with all the head to headache 
they send you all the rental statements every month. They keep you updated on what's happening, uh, where the market's at, how much you should or shouldn't increase your rent in. And it's not hard to get a property manager. Every area would have plenty of them and um, they'll be more than happy to take your business. Follow up question for me personally. Um, so with property management that you handle, so let's say it's somewhere in between, they charge 7%, let's say. Um, so that's finding new tenants, managing tenants. And then if something goes wrong, they charge you additionally. Is that how it works? No, so property manager will only ever make money on finding you a tenant. This can generally be one to two weeks of the rent. Um, you can always negotiate that, but that, that's that's one way that, and then they'll charge um, five to ten percent of the rent you get, regardless. But if there's a problem with the property, they don't make a buffer on it. They just say, look, the plumber said it's going to cost two hundred dollars, or the electrician's going to cost three hundred dollars. They get someone to go in, look at it, quote. They do all the liaising, and then you just pay them exactly what it is, and they pay it to the plumber. Um, so at the end of the day, they don't make money like that. The only ways. They make money is off the letting fee, finance, which is finding the tenant, and then the management fee, which is the day-to-day -day work. Yeah. I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, I see Tristan asked, Nima, thank you for your time today. Just a quick question on my end. You present and hold yourself very well and seem to have some fantastic networking skills. What is the best way to network locally and internationally for people like myself who don't have the networks like you do yet? Yeah, great question. So I didn't um, say this in my story, but a large part of what I did was cold calling. Um, meeting people is great. You get to connect with them on a greater level, but there's no way you can meet 50 people in a day, but you can call 50 people in a day. So what I did when I started the business, uh, which I should have mentioned, was I acquired a database, um, like a guy who was selling his business. He passed on his database to me, which allowed me to um, send emails out to all these people. Then whoever would engage in it, I would then call them. And I would keep persistently staying in touch with these people. And then sooner or later, when you provide a good service, they'll refer you to their friends and family. And people love persistence. They go, if this guy's going to call me every week and he's not making money off me, um, I'm sure he's going to continue that service when he is making money off me. And and um, they love to know people that are hardworking, care, and genuinely want to help. So if you show that, it'll help. When it comes to internationally, I didn't know many people in New York. Um, no one in my family is in finance, apart from my younger brother. Um, but so they're, they're all actually doctors and surgeons, so that. They can't, they can't introduce me to people in this realm. So um, what I did even when I went to New York was using my network. So all these people that I called called that are my clients, I would have asked them, look, do you know anyone, a friend or family there? Or sometimes it would be they'll, they'll introduce me to a friend of theirs that worked in finance in America in another city who then knew someone in New York they introduced me to. So it's all about you've got to think creatively and maximise your current network and if you don't have a current network, as I did, I purely started with just uh, cold calling people. Love it. How many times would you follow up out of curiosity? Like if they you get no response, let's say you emailed or texted them or something, how many times would you follow up? <laughs> the same goes, they, they either buy or die. I think I, I would follow up till I literally thought, they changed their phone number or, or, or they were dead. I mean, there was no way of getting through to them anymore. I even went to the extent sometimes where I knew they wouldn't respond to me anymore. Mm -hmm. So I would also my team to call them on their phone, not in a harassment way, but just in a way that I never wanted to let something die unless it was truly dead. So, yeah. Yeah, that's really cool. That's really cool. <laughs> I feel like I'm at that stage in my business <laughs> No, I'm trying to gauge, so I appreciate that. Um, okay, next question. I want to make sure I don't skip any. Okay, um, don't some mortgage brokers take fees? Can you negotiate those? Also, wait, I'll, I'll stick to these two before I go to the third one. So don't some mortgage brokers take fees? Can you negotiate those? Yeah, if a mortgage broker takes fees, they shouldn't. 
Um, I know some might because they might do a lot of work because a mortgage broker only gets paid when they get you the loan and in the bank they take you to pays in the commission. So I know some brokers on complex situations, they're like, look, there's no way I'm going to do all this work and then not get paid because a lot of that is a competitive landscape. A lot of the time people engage two, three different brokers. So brokers are aware of that. They want to make sure they're not being shopped. They're not being used. Um, so confirm that if you, if you have a good relationship with a broker and he wants to charge you, say, look, don't charge me because I will use you at the end of the day. Um, and you will get your commission from the bank, say that you know that they have to actually disclose that to you as well. Um, so they should never charge you. And um, negotiation, you can do it. And I feel like I shouldn't be saying this because a lot of people can use it now against me is once you build a good relationship with a broker and you know how much they make because they've got to disclose off your loan how much they make, you can say that I'll continue to use if you give 30% of your commission to me. Um, or more so before you even engage the broker, say, I want to work on a referral basis that any client I give you, you give me 30% of your commission um, and then you be you then refer yourself to them, which they still have to honour because you are a lead and you can actually get a percentage of the commission they make from you because it is a sales industry. Brokers are hungry and, and a lot of brokers will be willing to share part of their commission and receive no commission. It's like a really cool trick. I feel like that's one that only like you guys would know. Um, okay, that's awesome. So second part of my question. Also, do you think now is still a good time to invest considering the uncertainty with the market and high interest rates? Yeah, great question. I mean, I, I always say there's always a good time to buy. It's just a matter of where, right? And the price you buy it for. Like a house that's worth $500,000 might be bad at $500,000, but it, $400,000, it's a great deal. So it's what price you get it for. So um, obviously you want to make sure the property sound like it's going to be there in 10 years. It's not going to be vacant, like it's solid. We, we run 30 different metrics to make sure the property is going to be great over the long term. As long as those basic needs are there, then um, there's always great properties. I mean, we're, it's such a big world, um, depending on which country you are, different markets boom at different times. Um, if you engage in a professional or do your own research, you'll know which cities are good, which ones new schools or universities are coming, new train stations, and that in itself will bring capital growth because people will always need a house over their head. I mean, there's a housing crisis everywhere with, with, what, with what's going on with inflation and how hard it is to get equipment now. Building a new house is so much more expensive than it used to be. So by that, naturally, property values have gone up. And they can't actually keep up with the amount of uh, demand. They can't build as many houses as new people are coming in to the world because of all of these e issues with, um, you know, bringing materials from across the world or more so having the amount of builders that are required. So I always think property you can't lose in the long run if you buy the right property. And there's definitely still good deals you can find that aren't just going to be good in the long run, but you can buy them and undervalue and unlock the equity in. So, um I definitely think so. Yeah, and I know like even when in interest rates here were three around three percent, um, like I had a lot of people telling me not to buy, <laughs> which is like the interest rates are so low. So honestly, there's no right time. Or like if it, someone's trying to wait, there's always someone that's gonna tell you this is a bad time. Um, I can personally yeah. like yeah. say that. Um we were the other day don't ever take advice from someone that's not where you want to be um so if someone's broke don't get advice on how to get rich uh, only get money only get advice on money from people who've actually achieved where you want to go i think that's honestly full stop as simple as that um and when there's blood on the street that's the time to go and clean up like right now interest rates are high people are being forced to sell it's actually even better than what it was when interest rates were two percent so I think there's a lot of bargains out there, to be honest with you. Agreed. Agreed. Um, another question I see here, which North American cities do you think would be the next best property location, if you know? Okay. Uh, ask me that in about a year's time and I'll answer you um, because all my properties are in Australia. Um so I can tell you potentially where in Australia, but in America, I don't want to give you the wrong advice and, and I don't have any properties in Australia, in America. So 
Uh, unfortunately, I can't help with that question. Awesome. Okay. I don't see any other questions in the chat. If anyone wants to ask a question, put your hand up and I'll try and keep a look out. I'm going to get to my questions now. Um, okay, so first question. So with your company, Caramani Capital, um, if someone wanted to loan now who's in the United States, can they get a loan from you? Like if I wanted to buy a house, can I get a loan from you or no? Um, no, no. Um, with loans, I can only help Australians at the moment, um, but with the investing pre-IPO, anyone who does want to buy a property in Australia, I can help. I've only recently grown my business out to the US and we're only doing at the moment the stock market and the private equity stuff stuff. So if people uh, want to fast track their deposit or invest in alternative investments, I can help you. But as far as um, property and mortgages go, we can only really help in Australia, um, but that could change in the future. Yes, please do, because we would love to have an Australian person, like a Australian bank to give our money to for loans. Um, awesome. Okay, a next question. Um, what stocks did you invest in uh, when you were saving money for your first house in that, and what year was that? So I know you said you made some some bets on, on the stock market. What stocks did you pick and what year were they? Yeah, yeah, great question. So it would have been um, around 2019. Mm -hmm. um, and I was buying after pay and zip when uh, buy now, pay later was booming. So they, those were probably my biggest wins. Um, one earlier was Sydney Airport, which because of COVID, um, you know, all flights and airports crashed, right? That we knew that they're not going to go bankrupt. If, 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 an airport will still have to operate one day when flights are there. So it just lo made honest, logical sense to buy it. And then that doubled in money after COVID and a, a private equity firm um, purchased the company. That, those, are the, those are the few best ones that I remember that I made more than double my money on um, after pay zip and uh, Sydney Airport. Um, yeah. Lovely. I, I made some money off after pay too. So <laughs> nice, nice. Um, well, okay. I had a question about, do you think it's better to pay down a loan or buy a new property? So like, let's say I'll give you my exact, um, so I know, right. Okay. I would just say, so with my two properties, I got, I got it at 3% and 3.5%. So I know these are relatively like low. This is almost like free money that we're getting. Um, but maybe the next property I get, maybe the interest rate is at 7%. Is it worth paying down the 7% to pay it off quicker than 30 years? Or is the play to just like keep buying properties, do you think? Yeah, great, great question. I think, um, I think you know what I'm going to say, because I love I mean, my growth strategy. I will any day, I think even if interest rates are at 10%, I'm still going to be not paying down and buying more because okay. if you're buying a property straight away at 15 or 20% discount and it's growing at 7 8% a year, you could do the maths and know that it's worth it, especially in the short term to do that, then pay the interest rates. So I always think um, focus on growing at first, get to the point where you've built the asset base to where you want it, and then focus on um, consolidating debt. If you're young, you got time, you got the ability to take these risks. I think go big uh, because you're not going to retire on one or two properties. You need at least a multitude of these, and and then that's the reality. Agreed. I'm going to go to someone else's question before I ask my last two questions. So I saw Michelle wrote Nima John. Thank you for sharing your story. Great information. And then we have another question saying, any stocks you recommend? Not financial advice, obviously. Um, I'm definitely not going to answer that <laughs> um, because if it doesn't go well, I will be cancelled. No, I'm kidding. But um, and then if it goes well, um, you, you got to make sure to use my services. <laughs> but no, um, any stocks? I um, I'm focusing on a lot of private companies right now. There's one I'm looking at, which is Jib J I B B. Um, you can look it into it. My group 
um, our company investors are going to make an investment into this company. Um, this is public knowledge as well, so I'm, I'm happy to share it. Um, the company is JIBB. So, um, yeah, if, if, you're, if you're interested, feel free to reach out to me um, or the company directly. Sounds good. Sounds good. Thank you for this great program. Hope to have more of it. Um, okay, switch back to my questions. Um, did you ever like um, like try and raise money for your company? Uh, like as in like Shark Tank, uh, maybe not Shark Tank style, but like VC, like, hey, I'll give you like 5%, I don't know, 10% for like 100,000 or like anything like that. Or you've just put all the money in or like, how we'd love i'd love to know <laughs> yeah great question i'm i'm quite proud of this because it was very difficult but i never borrowed money off anyone or brought any investor everything is um uh, i'm the only shareholder of my company and and all the money's invested myself um completely depends on what you do i'm a service business so we don't have a lot of outgoing costs my only outgoing costs are um staff and offices but obviously I would only expand once I had a lot of profit to pay for that. So I was never risking um, making those expenses. So for a business like that, I think it's good to, to save and, and, and use your own money. Um, but um, I think if you're like a tech business that it's all about the fast growth, it is very good to get like VCs involved because they'll be able to, they've done it with like 10 other businesses and they can see the difference between a successful and non-successful. So they can give you that guidance and mentorship that's worth going to them because at the end of the day, it's like, do you want to own 100% of a business worth 1 million or like 20% of a business worth $100 million? You know, that that's what a VC allows you to do. That's the whole mindset. So I'd say it really depends on the business. Um, but if it's, um, if you're, if you're interested in starting business, I'm more than happy to give you guidance on, on, on what, what to do. Um, but I personally, it was for myself, but I'm saying that's, that doesn't mean everyone has to do what I do. That's fair. That's awesome that you were able to do it with your own funds. I just like remember you as a paper boy, like <laughs> saving your 15, 20K and like, look how far you've come. Um, do you feel comfortable sharing like, like your company's like yearly income or company valuation? Yeah, I mean, valuation is, is subjective, but um like last financial year, the business did overturn a, a seven-figure amount. So, um, I mean, that's that's as far as I'm willing to to share. I don't know everyone know the ins and outs, but I, I am quite proud of that. Um, and a lot of the time when we invest in businesses, um, we also take a very large equity stake in the business. So bear in mind, if the business does succeed, um, obviously we then get a lot of, return from that as well. So that helps with our annual turnover. And that's companies that you guys help IPO? Exactly, yeah. Got you. So that was like seven figures was the annual, the annual or the valuation? No, seven, seven figures is last year. It, it, last year, Kamani Capital made a, a seven-figure seven profit. Um, okay. The valuation is, is subjective if you want to value it uh, five times EBITDA or, or 10 times. Um, I I would only care about my business's value if I was planning to bring on an investor or sell it, which I'm not planning to do. I plan on it being like a kind of like a family legacy. So for me, the only relevant thing is how quickly we're growing, new clients we're acquiring, revenues growing, profits growing. Um, so I'm so happy that within a short period of time that I've reached this, this profit level. We're so proud of you and we're so excited to see more of you. Uh, we love that you're interested in like Zoroastrianism and you want to be involved and, um, you know, soon to be like a part of Zaina officially. So we'll announce that later. But yeah, this is hopefully just the beginning of like super amazing things to come. And I know you're such an inspiration to all of the people that have heard you speak today. Thank you so much, everyone, for your time. And, and um, Kimi, I'm very thankful thankful for having me. And, um, yeah, hopefully um, we can all do great things together. <laughs>